Welcome back, everybody. Holy smoking biscuits. It has been a while. Uh, I had some travel come up, so I was away for a couple weeks, but I'm back now. Bit of a simpler, smaller video for me to sort of cleanse my palate and get back into the flow of things. And so, in this video, I'm going to be talking about my personal opinions on why you should really reconsider a function structure if you are writing if without an else. It's going to be theoretical, it's going to be a bit more argumentative, so if you're not interested in that kind of video, wait for the next one. Got some cool stuff coming out. But for those of you who are interested in this sort of thing, let's dig into it. So, first things first, what do we have going on in this file? Well, we have a variable called r, and it is assigned to an array. This is going to serve as our database. We have uh, each record is going to just be an object, and each property will serve as our columns. So we have an ID column, a name column, and a fave animal column. All this function down here does, get name animal, is kind of what it sounds like. It takes an ID, takes a database, in this case just our R <laughs> variable, which is just our array of objects, and it returns the name and fave animal property of whatever record, in this case object, matches the ID that was passed in. And it does a check to make sure before it returns values that those, uh, sorry, that that record actually exists. So it will check to make sure that there is a record with an ID of, in this case, three, and it will return that matching record if it exists. Uh, so let's just clear the console. I think it's cleared. Yes, it was. And so let's run through the function kind of quickly here. Um, this is not a function structure that I endorse. <laughs> I, we're going to be refactoring this throughout the course of this video. So uh, I thought about throwing semi semicolons in here just to make it extra clear that I do not support this function structure. But uh, this is what we're starting with. Uh, so we're declaring our variables, name, fave animal. Uh, we are creating an array of IDs by mapping over our database, which again is our array of objects, and just grabbing the ID property off of each one. We'll then check that array of IDs for the index of the ID that was passed in, and that will give us essentially the row in the pseudo table that we're creating. Store that in the I variable, then we'll do this nasty type coercion thing, and that will basically say if that record exists, then modify the name argument, or name variable, sorry, to be the name property of that record, and likewise for fave animal, then return name and fave animal in a pair. And so if we look at our function signature, it takes the number, or the, the ID, which is a number, the database, which is an array of objects, and returns a pair of strings. Fairly simple, fairly straightforward. Let's make sure this puppy works. And there we go, Jeff Whale. We passed in the ID of three, it found the record with the ID of three, and it returned a name and a favorite animal. So, it is working. Now, what would happen if I were to replace this with five? If I run this now, well, we get a pair of undefineds. And that's because our function, our function doesn't blow up, so that's good, right? It doesn't just end an error. Well, I shouldn't say that's good. I would argue you should have an error, but a lot of people would probably say it's good that we're doing a check before we modify our variables and try to access something that might not be there. But my concern is now we have a type signature that is absolutely lying to us because a pair of undefineds is not a pair of strings. It's not even the string of undefined. It's just the undefined global variable. And so, you know, if you're a savvy little imperative programmer, you might say, all right, well, I can fix that. I'll just put fave uh, animal and name and just instantiate them immediately, or initialize them, sorry, immediately with the empty string uh, values, and now they'll only be modified if it matches, and if not, it'll return empty strings. Okay? 
And so if we run this, now we get empty strings. It's better. We have satisfied our type signature. So there are a few, there are a few issues here. First thing I want to cover is this whole manual hoisting tomfoolery up here. So it's less obvious now that these variables exist strictly for the purpose of being reassigned because we have actually given them values. In this situation, we can see, okay, these variables were declared and they weren't giving a value. So either the, they're never going to be used, which would mean that they should be removed, or they exist purely for the purpose of being reassigned. And I'm going to argue that they are being reassigned. Someone might look at this and say, all right, there is no assignment variable fo or operator following this. An operator variable, or operator, sorry, an assignment operator, this equals symbol, does not exist in this line. So you might say, all right, well, we're declaring them on line 15, and then on lines 19 and 20, we are actually giving them their values. This would be manual hoisting. So you're basically, the argument I often hear for this is people saying that we are trying to signal to future readers of this code that these are the variables that you have access to inside of this scope. Now, if you're writing small, provable, composable functions, one, you're probably not going to make variables for the purpose of reassigning them because that would go against immutability. Excuse me. But more importantly, your functions aren't getting that long. So do you really need to add lines of code to declare your variables just so that you know what variables you have access to inside your function? I would say probably not. But something a bit more insidious is going on here because those people who would argue that these are being declared and then assigned, you're just splitting them into two different, uh, two different locations in your code. If that were true, then we could say replace let with const because all const does is prevent a variable from being reassigned. But if I change this to const, my linter eventually it takes some time when I'm recording, but eventually we'll get mad at me because it's not expecting a comma to be following the name, or, uh, name variable. And that's because const needs to be assigning a value to an argument. Because if you are creating a var variable and you're not giving it a value, I think I said argument, but I meant value, if you're not giving it a value, you have no other reason for creating it other than to reassign it later. So, anyway, this is, a, this is quite the tangent on these, this manual hoisting thing, but it ties into the uh, if-else later, I, I promise. So anyway, you're declaring these so that you can modify them, you can mutate the values, because these do exist as undefined. Let name, when you do this, you are saying let name equals undefined, let fave animal equal undefined. And so, only if this condition is true do you mutate it, otherwise you return it. And so the purpose of this is basically to say, we want these variables to exist inside of this scope so that we can return them, but under certain conditions we want to mutate that value, otherwise we'll just use the defaults. To me that sounds a lot like an if something, do this, otherwise do something else. And that's kind of what's still happening. You're just moving your else to above your if and then removing your else. So it's a bunch of noise. But let's really think about what's going on here. You have an if and then you have no else. So this would be like telling somebody that you've invited them to a party and they ask, how do I get there? And you say, all right, well, just go out your driveway, turn right, head up Airport Road until you get to the Starbucks, turn left, and if the bridge is open, take the bridge with the first house on the right. And then they might look at you after thinking for a second and say, okay, what if the bridge is down? And if, or what if I can't take the bridge, uh, more generally speaking? And based on the way that you've written this function, you would have to basically look at them and then just turn and walk away because there is no answer given. When you are presenting someone with an if, you are saying you can, under some condition, go left, under another condition, go right. 
and all you've given them is instructions on how to go left. JavaScript won't get mad at you for that. It will just continue on, sometimes implicitly returning a undefined if necessary. Uh, in this case, it'll just run your code to the end of your scope anyway. But what's really happening in this, inside of this if block is all of the useful computation that happens in this function. If this code is not executed, there's no reason for this function to actually run. That's very important here. If this code does not run, this function is pointless. And so if a function can run and either give you a pointless value, a useless value, to include and to avoid any confusion, a useless value, or a useful value, it's probably more sensible to just take the if out of that function and decide whether to run that function at all. So let's think about that. We'll create a predicate function and uh, what should we say? Call it like is in db. And so it will take uh, the same arguments, number, which will be the ID, and the database, which will be an array of objects. And then it will return a boolean. So, oops, let, actually I'll do it the same way so that's consistent. Is in db, id, db. All right, so what do we have to put in here? We have to, uh, we're going to need our list of IDs. That there. And that guy. All right, let me see if that is correct. Uh, not equal to negative one. Now, this is my segue into this type coercion that's happening down here. You'll see up here, what I've done is returned a Boolean. And I've returned a Boolean by using a comparison operator, in this case, not strictly equal to. We have functions built into the language, binary functions, in the form of these comparison operators who pure, important, strictly defined job is to create booleans out of expressions and do comparison by doing comparisons on them. And so anytime that you have a value inside of an if statement or a ternary, I guess, which is just another uh, structure for an if statement, it makes no sense to me to do some sort of weird implicit type coercion. Because, for example, if I were to, right now what is happening here is I'm using some, I'm using the bitwise not operator to flip this. If it is negative one, it'll flip it to positive one and then subtract one, which will make it zero. And then that will be coerced by the if into a falsy value, or well, is a falsy value. So it'll be coerced into false. That's just a whole bunch of tomfoolery that could be solved by, or removed by just going not equal to negative one. And what this tells me, oops, what this tells me is this is probably an, supposed to be a number. In this case, we can tell above it would be an index. Since negative one is a failed uh, lookup for an index in an array, then we can infer very easily that this is an index. If it fails, then it will satisfy, or if it succeeds, sorry, it will satisfy this if block. If we just have an I, and let's say for some reason this is magically far, far away. Line 23 is uh, really far away in our program. It's very difficult to find. I, in this case, could be any falsy value or truthy value, I guess. It could be pretty much anything. It could be undefined. It could be zero. Uh, it could be null. It could be pretty much anything. We don't know what i is. We just know that it's something that can be potentially a false value. And so I would encourage you in this rant on making more, uh, more stable, easy to understand, and reason about code, 
uh, that you just use the, arg the operators that are built into the language to express these things. In this case, a strictly not equal to operator that will return a boolean. So, tangent over. Now, let's use is in db as our predicate to determine whether or not this function should actually be run. All right, so let's do that up here. I wouldn't normally just throw a ternary in here, but this is going to make a fair bit of sense in this case. There's an emergency. It seems like every time I record one of these videos, there's some horrible emergency happening right outside my apartment. Anyway, I'll code while they do that. All right, so what we've done up in this ternary is we have moved our default value that we are originally uh, er, initializing our variables with on line 21 in out of our function, because our function shouldn't have to care about that. And we're also moving the if condition, which decides whether or not that function should run, out of the function. Because why would a function have to decide if it should run if you've already called it? That's something I don't understand. So if you have an if and nothing else after it, you're really just saying, hey, do something useful or just don't do something useful, but we're gonna run you no matter what. How about we just don't run those lines of code for absolutely no reason and decide outside of that function if it should be run. So we can remove that guy. We can, uh, we'll keep that. And let's see here. Uh, let's actually just destructure it, and that'll make it nice and pretty. So let's name fave animal equals, and then uh, that's not what I want. I want db. All right. So if you're not familiar with destructuring, assuming I haven't messed anything up here, what we're doing is we are grabbing that record using the same logic as we were before, but we're just putting it into one expression. Uh, so we're grabbing the correctly indexed record if it exists, uh, and then returning or assigning the name property and the fave animal property, and then we're just going to return them. Let me just see, do I need, yes, I do need that. All right, I think I've done everything correctly. Let's run this and see. There we go, we get our default values, and then if we, let's, place this, do 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 do. And there we go, all right. And just because this is my favorite one, let's look up Yoda, make sure this works. There's our Yoda, he loves Ewoks. And so this has, been, this has been a bit of a ranty video, like I said, getting back into the flow of making these things. But the point I want to drive home here is really ask yourself, one, when you're making a function, am I doing something inside of that function that could probably be, probably be best handled outside of it? And likewise, if you are writing a function where you are declaring a bunch of variables and then initializing them elsewhere, do you really need to split those two things up? Or should all of this happen at once, which it pretty much always should, in my opinion, or at least you can refactor so that it can happen. Because you'll notice that before the return statement in both of these functions, we've managed to just naturally have all of our function or all of our variable declarations bubble up to the top lines of our scope, but they're assigned variable or values right away, because that just sort of naturally stems from this. Up here, what we've done is we pulled out that if condition to decide if the valuable uh, computation should be run, and left only the useful computation inside of the function, so that we don't have to decide inside of the function whether it could be useful or totally useless. This is a hint at something that's coming out 
soon uh, in my next mini series, which is the maybe functor. And so this is essentially one way you could implement it very manually and just say, under some condition, run this block of code. Otherwise, don't run that block of code and provide some sort of default value. In a maybe, that would be execute the function on this particular value or return nothing if it, if it can't be done. So if you find this sort of thing interesting, uh, this will hopefully, and you're new to maybes, this should hopeful, hopefully be a useful primer for you to get your brain thinking about why these sorts of things might be useful. And if it uh, was just a total waste of your time, I apologize. Tell me why you didn't like it in the comments. Also, if you're wondering about uh, these trailing commas, which are obviously a complete abomination to this elegant piece of code that I've presented you with, um, that's because my linter does not like leading commas. And uh, I just started up adding a linter. For those of you who have been following me for a big a time, watching these videos for a while, you'll know that I started using Vim only a handful of months ago. And I've really just started adding tooling to it. And so I just threw in standard JS as per uh, Brian Holt. And uh, yeah, it doesn't like trailing or it doesn't like leading commas. So instead of having it complain at me, I've just put them there. Anyway, guys, hope you enjoyed this first video back. I will be putting out some, a bit more informative content than this on the regular. Happy to be back. Looking forward to it. And I'll see you in the next video. Bye.